We are going to wait just another moment or so to allow anyone else who's trickling in to come on into the event and then we'll get started. Good evening and welcome to tonight's live online author event with Greenlight Bookstore. I'm Kay from Greenlight and we're thrilled to host tonight's event with Amitava Kumar presenting his new book, A Time Outside This Time. He will then be talking with Robert Boynton and Francine Prose about novels and the news. So you're in for an excellent time. Before we start, I want to say a huge thanks to Amitava, Robert, and Francine, and the team at NOP for making this happen, and to all of you for showing up. Although we're not able to host events in our store spaces, our community of authors and readers is still here. We're grateful for your support and for the chance to make space for conversation and connection. Now, just a couple of housekeeping things. In our Zoom webinar tonight, you can see and hear the speakers, but they can't see or hear you. They can see that you're here though, and there are a couple of different ways you can interact with the authors and with each other throughout tonight's event, which we highly encourage. The first is the chat, which you can find by clicking on the icon that looks like one speech balloon. You're welcome to post your comments and thoughts in the chat. That's a great way to show your appreciation for the authors and interact with fellow attendees. If you have a specific question you'd like to have answered by the authors, please post that question in the Q&A module. You can find it by clicking on the icon that looks like two speech balloons. We'll be pulling questions only from the Q&A to be answered in the later part of the program. And importantly, tonight's featured book, A Time Outside This Time, is available for sale from Greenlight Bookstore. You can shop in person from 10 a.m. to 7 p.m. at both our Fulton Street and Flatbush Ave stores where you can purchase Amitava's book and many others on site. You can also order online at greenlightbookstore.com for a quick pickup at the store or for shipping anywhere in the US. I'll drop the buy link in the chat. If you care about supporting the careers of authors and the ongoing existence of independent bookstores, buying tonight's featured book is a great way to show your support. And now I'll briefly introduce tonight's panelists. Robert S. Boynton runs NYU's Literary Reportage Concentration. He is the author of The New New Journalism and The Invitation Only Zone. He has written about culture and ideas for The New Yorker and Harper's. Francine Prose is the author of numerous books of fiction and nonfiction. Prose is a former president of Penn American Center and a member of the American Academy of Arts and Letters and the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. She is a distinguished writer in residence at Bard College. Robert and Francine will be speaking with our featured author, Amitava Kumar. Amitava Kumar is a writer and journalist. He was born in Ara, India and grew up in the nearby town of Patna, famous for its corruption, crushing poverty and delicious mangoes. Kumar is the author of the novel, Immigrant Montana, as well as several other books of nonfiction and fiction. He lives in Poughkeepsie, New York, where he is a professor of English on the Helen D. Lockwood chair at Vassar College. Amitava's new book, A Time Outside This Time, is a blistering novel about a writer's creative response to the daily onslaught of fake news, memory, and the ways in which truth gives over to fiction. Amitava is going to start us off with a reading from the book, and then he'll be taking, he'll be talking with our panelists tonight and with all of you. Please take it away, Amitava. Thank you, thank you. And uh, thank you everyone for showing up. Uh, let me start on a, a rather depressing note. Parul Sagal isn't here because she is sick. Uh, but you know, we hope to entertain you and uh, enlighten you, I suppose, because the great Francine Prose and the wonderful Robert Boynton are here with me. Um, I'm going to read just for a couple of minutes, and then I'm going to ask Francine to also, if she would read from her last book, The Vixen. 
when I was a boy in my hometown and it had been raining for three days, it became so that it was no longer possible to have any consciousness of a time when it wasn't raining. Rain soaked through the walls and slime grew on the inside, in the corners and even on the ceiling. Phones stopped working. No newspapers came. Birds disappeared from the wet branches of trees. No question of going to school. There was no language outside of, it is raining outside. Water stood in the distant fields. It rushed down pipes and roared in the gutters. The roads became rivers in which people waded or swam. Brish Bihari brought his cows onto the veranda at the back of our house. Mother would switch on the fans in one room to try to dry the wet clothes. It was all in vain. The snake found in the toilet was proof that the outside, that the world outside had changed and the natural order had been turned upside down. Only rain was permanent. You could do nothing but wait. I'm saying all this because that is exactly what has happened to us politically. We cannot imagine, I cannot imagine sometimes, a time outside this time. The people who are in power must also be deluded enough to believe this. They must think that their power is eternal, that they will sit on the throne forever. And it is this thought that is their failing because it condemns them to missteps and error. Stay alert. You will hear the rain stop and the wind shift. The powerful will not be waiting for it, but that moment will come. It will mark the beginning of their doom, their end. So that was a little passage. Francine, your turn, friend. I'm on. Okay. Yes. I'm going to read from my new novel, The Vixen, uh, which has in its background or middle ground, let's say, um, the execution of, of Julius and Ethel Rosenberg which was a news item in 1953. So this is the very beginning. I'm just going to read briefly. June 19th, 1953, Coney Island, Brooklyn, New York. The shades are drawn, the apartment dark, except for the lunar glow from the kitchen and in the living room, the flicker of the 12 inch black and white screen. My parents and I are silent. The only signs of life squawk and jitter inside the massive console TV. My mother and I have been watching all day and now my father has come home to join us. Dad and I share the love seat. It's comfortable sitting close. Mom lies on the couch under a brown and orange crocheted blanket that she found in a second hand shop. Sewn onto the blanket is a hand embroidered silk label that says, made especially for you by Patricia. Look, mom, I say, your blanket's lying. Who is it? My mother says, though it's not especially hot outside, our air conditioner is blasting. We're chilly, but we can't leave the room or adjust the thermostat. Changing channels is beyond us. We'd have to get up and fiddle with the antenna. My father's exhausted from work on the long subway ride home. My mother's migraines have grown so unpredictable, her spells of vertigo so severe that she'd have to cross the carpet on her knees like a penitente. I can't even speak for fear of hearing the reedy, imploring voice of my boyhood. Hey mom, hey dad, what do you think? Would another channel be better? Another channel would not be better. The Rosenbergs would still be dying. Beautiful, thank you. You know, when, when I got the invite from uh, Greenlight to do a, an event, I immediately thought of the two of you because I had just read Francine's book and I thought, here's a response to something in the news, something that was very important in the news, but it's a different kind of response. It's a satiric, satirical novel and it is a comedic novel. And I thought of Robert because every semester, every year in the spring, I teach a course on journalism and I always use a book that Robert edited called New, New Journalism. And I thought if we are going to discuss novels in the news, I would ask Robert to speak a little bit about the news and what happens when journalists uh, write, what happens when journalists write their books as if they were writing novels 
and also what uh, if he has something to say about folks who are not journalists who write about things in the news so that's where this idea for this panel came for and um, i'm happy that you're here um, so maybe i could ask both of you to give me an example of it's a very broad, broad category a novel about the news do you have some favorites maybe robert we could begin with you and then go to francine no, I don't know many novels about the news. I mean, the one the one that occurred to me uh, was uh, Michael Frayn's first novel was called The Tin Men. And in it, it's about uh, all these different uh, sort of oddball inventors who are trying to make everything automatic. And one of them was trying to create uh, an automa automated news um, service that would decide, do sort of customer uh, research and decide what people wanted to hear about. And then what, and then would then generate headlines that would please people and would get, which is not that far from what, you know, with, with the uh, search engine optimization and other things that people do. Uh, that was the one, and he's also written a few other novels in which sort of journalists are characters. I always find that those sort of inside books in which journalists are characters are never quite as interesting as the ones where something like, uh, you know, something books about Watergate or, or or books about the Catholic Church or something where where the journals really are characters, but the nonfiction books. Um, but you know, I, I I sort of I'm I'm kind of a not a purist about it, but I tend to take my journalism straight in the sense that um, you know the journalism that I care most about is determinedly factual, uh, but really in this tradition from uh, Tom Wolf uh, on thinking about writing. It, it, the, the, these books of nonfiction in a way that makes them feel like novels. This sort of the, the art of uh, literary journalism at its very best. Um, and so it, it's, you know, when you play around with this idea of having a, a news in a novel, uh, it, it's, I feel like it's, there's this continuum where it's sort of the pure novel and the pure news, you know, breaking news and the fantastical novel. And in between the, the, the novel, which has news in it and the, nonfiction, which is written like a novel, sort of brush up against each other. And that's, to me, the most interesting uh, work. And that's one of the reasons it was such a fun, fun thing to read your book. Oh, thank you. All right. What about you, Francine? Uh, this is aside from your book, right, Ami Tava? Yes, I mean, yes, yes, yes. Are there other books? Well, <laughs> I have two of them, actually. One is, yes. uh, it's a book that I love that no one seems much to have read, which is called The Winshaw Legacy by Jonathan Coe. It's a British novel. And it's about the way in which the kind of trashy Rupert Murdoch uh, uh, culture came into Great Britain and the, the influence, I mean, Thatcher and Murdoch and all that. So it's kind of wonderful and also funny. And then also just interpreting your question broadly, uh, one of my favorite novels in general, which I'm just taking this as an excuse to talk about is, is Roberto Bolaño's 2666, which in a way is about the news because it's about the, the thing in the news that no one is willing to talk about. I mean, the murders of the women on the Texas, uh, on the Mexican US border and, and all the way through, I mean, there's a whole the horrible section about the part of the crimes is presented as a series of police reports or news reports and underneath their strands of plots that are being woven. But, but he uses that to kind of be, begin to address the theme of evil, which is running throughout the entire book. Yeah. Well, uh, I must share with our audience that I'm just engaging in this conversation because I want to learn the titles of several books and several ideas I want to get clarified with this conversation with you guys. So now, well, I should mention that there's one book which I want to know if you guys have read. It had an odd title, H H. H H by Lauren Binet and it won the Prix Goncourt or something in the award in Paris in, and it is about um, the assassination of the Nazi leader. Uh, what is his name? Reinhard Heydrich? Heydrich? Heydrich. Heydrich, yeah. Yeah, Heydrich. Heydrich. Um, the title comes from uh, what used to be a sort of a line that used to be repeated in the SS circles. Himmler's brain is called Heydrich. So H H H H, you know, that way. And it, uh, I liked it. And I was curious because you have, you guys haven't read it, but maybe folks, oh, all right. 
someone green light book bookstore has put it up on <laughs> excellent excellent that's the way to go um one of the i'm things, writing it down yes yes uh and the link is right there you can save it friends um is that uh the writer shares with the reader the way he is researching the topic and where he goes wrong. And uh, I think that part is very attractive to me because then you are showing the scaffolding of the making of your novel. You're not pretending that it is all conjured out of here. Yeah. And uh, I kind of like it, but I wanted you guys to say, is that annoying to you or do you, can you speculate? I, I love that form as a form of, uh... It's funny, again, as a form of journalism, it's one of the narratives that we teach. Uh, actually, I was just teaching last week. Uh, both Jen and Malcolm and Ron Rosenbaum and a whole bunch of other writers use this trope of, you know, trying to figure things out, all right, trying to piece things together, going down dark alleys and stuff. And of course, it's all made up because they've figured things out or haven't by the end of the book. But it's a very powerful one, uh, this kind of... Um, what I call sort of the process piece. What is the process of the making of the piece? And how can we take the reader through the, the work that we're doing, supposedly in the, in the guise of the journalist, but you know, the naive narrator, right? I knew nothing in the beginning and I gradually become something. I think that's one of the most powerful narrative techniques, whether in fiction or nonfiction that, that, that I can think of. Excellent, what do you think, Francine? Well, I was wondering, uh, Robert, are you talking about the Janet Malcolm's 41 false starts? Is that, is that what you teach or? No, I was actually, well, we did teach that actually, uh, but I was thinking uh, more just her profiles and her book about Sylvia Plath and, um, and uh, you know, those kinds of things where it's, you know, about, I mean, Janet Malcolm's books are come with me on this trip, uh, whether, you know, it's about psychoanalysis or, not so much photography, but um, that great piece she wrote, uh, Iphigenia in Queens about the murderer. Uh, you know, it's trying to piece together something and you are right there with her, you're tracking her. Uh, Ron Rosenbaum does this too, sort of the quest narrative, you know, about say, finding J.D. Salinger or, or something like that. He's, you know, he's taking you with him with his obsession. And I think that, you know, be able to get on board with a writer's obsession is uh, is one of the most delicious narratives uh, in fiction or nonfiction. Well, you know, Janet Malcolm is so good at it that she actually can make you, however briefly, uh, believe things that you don't actually believe. Right. I mean, you know, be, I mean, for example, the beginning of the journalist and the murderer, mm. where she compares the journalistic interview to the Milgram Payne experiment, and and you and also it's written in the second person. So you're going, yeah, yeah, it's, the interview is just like the Milgram Payne experiment. At the end, you disabuse the participants of their have they been hoodwinked, and only when you step back and you think, wait a second, the interview is absolutely nothing like the Milgram Payne experiment. What have I, what have I've been persuaded is the truth. In, in that piece by Janet Malcolm on uh, the murder in Queens that you're talking about, Robert, mm -hmm. uh, what is it called? Iphigenia in Forest Hills. Yeah, Forest Hills, that's right, yes. There is, a, there is also a sort of a move she makes where she describes the other journalists and how they co are covering the trial. Mm -hmm. And I find that a move like that, very she's so precise that through her observation of other practitioners of the art that she is engaged in, you begin to see very clearly what it is she is doing on the page. Cool. And that sort of meta move, if we call it that, is very attractive to me because I think your task should not be of reifying what you're doing, but actually explaining, exposing how, I mean, I think it's a Brechtian in its essence. Mm -hmm. And I, or I'm interested in that. And I'm always curious to know what people I love and adore think about it. So I want Asking you guys to again clarify whether you find it, you Robert is very clear on this. He seems to like it, but Francine, are you uh, a bit more ambiguous on this? No, no. I, I mean, I enjoy it, but but there are often pieces of journalism where I feel that I'm being, uh, well, let's say, manipulated in various ways uh, under the guise of 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 objectivity, and it's not object objective. And, and in fact, some of the pieces I teach, well, again, I mean, I don't mean to be harping on Janet Malcolm, but mm -hmm. is, is her piece about, you may remember about Ingrid Sishi, about the um, uh, uh, interview magazine, yeah, in which she goes to see all these artists, and, and essentially you're invited to judge them by their interior decor. 
-hmm. I mean, Barbara Rose has like fabulous couch. So she's a completely reliable witness. Whereas Alex Malaman, who's actually a friend of mine is in this, you know, cold water walk up on Canal Street and no one believes a single thing. He says, well, wrong. I mean, actually, decor and uh, and veracity don't necessarily go hand in hand or I mean you know fashionable decor mm -hmm. so so um so it's always interesting to me and it's very useful with students because I feel that it's a useful thing to do I mean that is because they're constantly being barraged with with you know they know what false news is I mean my bar kids know what false news is but often they don't know what false news is because there's news that they actually trust or or writing that they trust which is not entirely trustworthy and to encourage them to I mean that's one of the things that close reading is about saying like what are the facts that are forming that are causing you to form your, your opinions as you're reading them well I'm telling you what one of the real delights of your book is is the way that you do something close to this where you uh, take various uh, crimes, say in India or things that are taking place here and you show how the journalists have constructed the story and then show that the, if not the falseness, then at least the way in which it falls short of, of the truth of that. And that, that was a lot of fun too. I thought that was very enjoyable uh, to be taken down a, a, you know, a nice story and then not really be quite sure where it was ending and what the point was whether you're going to burst the bubble or not, as a way to sort of demonstrate what it's like to experience fake news. Yes, yes. I thought, thank you. I, I, I thought um, the idea of, you know, you must, you guys must be aware of a piece by David Gran in the New Yorker, for example, which was a, called Trial by Fire. Do you remember either of you? It was about the execution of a man who was innocent. Yeah. And the first part, I, I use it in my journalism class because the first part, convinces you about the state's prosecution and you believe that he is guilty. And then the journalist pulls the carpet from under your feet and you discover then why you should be skeptical mm -hmm. of the truth, especially the state's truth. And I have always found that instructive. And I, at least in one of the chapters in the book, I was trying to do that where the narrator goes to speak to the police and finds an informant. And I thought, because the world always, you know, reality is always surprising or exceeding our expectations. And certainly the state gives us a role in its bad fiction that has to be challenged. So that's what I was doing. Um, I was very conscious of one thing, uh, which is that in trying to dismantle the truth or in trying to present contrasting versions of the truth, I wasn't often doing something that was funny to which I'm always drawn. And Francine does that in The Vixen, because here you have the Rosenbergs and you have that tragedy, but someone has just written a book, which is a bodice ripper. Am I pronouncing it right, Francine? Bodice That's ripper? exactly right, yeah. So it, and I, there was a moment that I wanted to share with you guys. You know, the, the tweets that Trump was sending out even before he became president, about Obama's, you know, having born Bertha. in, uh, yeah. I thought the Daily Show, when it curated the Trump presidential Twitter library, mm. and then presented his tweets in these gilt-edged edged frames, and then described masterworks from the collection, and then had birth of a Bertha, and then had this language of art criticism, you know, I'll just read a couple of lines if people don't mind. Critics may disagree on the greatest of Trump's tweets, but all cite <clears throat> birth of a birther as his first unquestionable masterpiece. Taken as a standalone work, one can marvel at the audacity of his creative imagination, the delicacy of the halo of the quotations ex encircling extremely credible. It goes on in this vein. And so I wanted to ask Francine, you must have toyed with, I mean, you, you have known since childhood, I imagine, about the Rosenberg trial. I mean, you know, when you, since you were a little girl and ever since you became a writer, this has been in your, con you know, in your consciousness. It's an important marker in this country, in this culture, and perhaps even in your personal life. Um, but you waited and you turned it into something that is so more surprising and layered. So I wanted to, you to talk a little bit about how did you hit upon this particular plot 
to make it come alive in a very unexpected way? Well, I had to wait uh, for the Trump presidency to write it, actually, because uh, because the Cold War, the more reading I did about the Cold War was so similar to the moment from starting in 2016. But I have to say, Amitabha, one, I, one of the reasons that I admire your book so much is the way in which you took this head on front. I mean, you just really faced it because most of the writers I know, I mean, I was just reading one of the um, 10,000 interviews with Jonathan Franzen that appeared in the last couple of weeks. And, <laughs> and he said something like, well, uh, the reason that he said his novel in the 70s was his reluctance to write about, uh, you know, post-2016. And, and that really struck a chord with me because, because the Trump presidency occupied our consciousness in a way that no other presidency I can remember has. I mean, it was so, so much a part of our consciousness at every moment that, that it, I know for many of us, it felt like to write about characters who were living at the present moment and not that not make that as much a part of their daily thought process as it is with ours was was would to, was to be unconvincing and untrue to the characters so so that was one of the reasons that i decided to go back to 1953 but you just went for it thank you well francine i want i have been so thirsty for your praise that i'm just delighted that you're saying <laughs> you got it wonderful. now <laughs> no francine is a very tough critic you know what i'm saying it's uh so listen guys i have to ask you another question now for my self-education and i hope it is useful i see by the way i want to make sure that everyone someone had noted a little while ago in the chat that they couldn't hear me properly uh just signal if you are not able to hear because i cannot do anything else i'm not oh maybe I can. that's all that's good that's good there you go oh well, now can you i hope it's better i I did try to persuade my daughter to listen to us tonight. So I hope she's listening. Take dad's words seriously. Um, the question I wanted to ask you guys is not in opposition to this idea of finding or naming titles that are about the news. Can I have you guys mention one or two titles where you think the novels are preeminently political but they do not ever mention the news. You know, so it's not like foregrounding the news. Mm -hmm. And yet, you find, in your estimation, that these novels are political. Francine, you go first. Yeah, well, I, I've been reading Middlemarch, as I may have mentioned the last time I saw you. I'm actually in a book club, and we're reading Middlemarch. That's and right. it's at least 50% political. I mean, everyone thinks, every, when people remember it, they just think about Dorothy and her horrible marriage to yeah, Saba. Possible. But... Uh, but uh, so much of it is about the politics of Middlemarch. And there's a scene kind of early on in which there, there's a group of men who are deciding who's going to be the curate for the local charity ho fever hospital, which is such a model of how political decisions get made, the compromises, the positions, the outside interests that people have and so forth. And it's just pure politics. I mean, one of the things that's so impressive about the novel is the way she weaves this story of Dorothea's disappointments in with this other with everything else that's going on at the town and it's not it's certainly not the news because she wrote it about an, an era that was like what 30 or 40 years before she was writing the book but you know it's certainly true in the way it, that Shakespeare's history plays when you read those those uh discussions among the various plotters and conspirators and so forth and so forth. it seems like the present moment excellent hmm. Robert well, I was thinking about the you know one of the the best novels that has so far been written about the uh, Trump administration, which was written in two thousand and four by Philip Roth called The Plot Against America, which was this extraordinary book that was not about the news. It was about the fact that this sort of uh, counter fiction, right? This kind of uh, virtual fiction uh, that might have happened. And yet it was uh, looking into the soul of American politics and seeing something that was there and that had always been there and that uh, was going to come out, you know, you know 12 years later. Um, I mean, that I've been rereading that book recently. Just I, I found it just this so great how uh, how he channeled that not only I mean, there have always been demagogues in American politics, but the way that the people who are just waiting for the demagogue and they've got all these awful things that they won't they all feel I mean, people are awful they have awful feelings but they won't say them until this guy comes and allows them to say them and that was exactly the dynamic that we saw with trump hmm. 
Excellent. So we have noted that down and I'm sure Kay has already posted a link to that <laughs> title by that too. Excellent. I wanted to ask you, Robert, um, you used a phrase earlier in our conversation, the naive narrator. Yeah. Uh, what about the unreli unreliable narrator in the sense, someone like uh, Richard Kapuscinski was accused later on of making things up and stuff like that. How important is it, do you think, in journalism, when we are writing about the news or anything else, how, how important is it for someone to trust the narrator? Is it a totally wrong move to make to suggest in any way unreliability? It's, you know, it's a good question. And, and, and I think also unreliability is itself a, a you know, I, I have colleagues at NYU, one of my dearest friends there, who simply will not teach uh, Kapuscinski, Joseph Mitchell, I mean, all these people. Uh, I know Gay Talese, you know, he has a very strict, the Gay Talese has told me, uh, you know, he, if he even sees something to, to the effect of, you know, <clears throat> Philip, whom I'm calling so-and-so, you know, that kind of thing he will take the book and throw it across the room. I mean, he's an absolutist for real names, real people all the time. I, I'm not as strict as that, but I do think that they're, that they're both getting at something, which is that you need to be able to trust the narrator in a piece of, uh, if it wants to call itself journalism. This is why I think something like John Degada, I just think his claims are just nonsense. I mean, you know, literally nonsense right. that you can, you can call your, you know, you call your, I mean, even if it wants to call the essay, you can call your work nonfiction and then make things up. That's just nonsense. And, uh, and I think that that's the, so I do think the reliability of a narrator is essential. Now, the, 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 the narrator can call upon and engage with unreliable people, and then their reliability or lack thereof can be part of the story. But I think that there has to be a reliability baked into the narrator for a piece of nonfiction to work. Francine, what happens when the narrator is unreliable in fiction? I mean, I'm asking this because I think there is, you know, we will have to introduce this term that has now become so popular, autofiction for a moment. <laughs> you know, in what is considered autofiction, people often assume that the writer and the narrator or the writer is actually speaking entirely autobiographically when that category is entirely suspect i think um why why i mean i would like to ask you what happened i mean if, if do you do you do you like do you invest in this idea of or do you want to believe that uh, fiction writers are writing entirely about their own lives and does that help the cause of fiction or what you're reading? No, I mean, no, you may, I mean, I think part of our job is to make things up. That's yeah. why we call, that's why we're fiction writers. But but the thing about auto fiction is, is that you can, you know, reading, you can't imagine for five seconds that Karl Ove Kanausgaard really remembers everything his dad said to him cooking shrimp or whatever, you know, 30 years ago. So, so any sensible person knows that this is that this has to be partly made up because nobody's memory is there. I mean, Rachel Cusk likewise. I mean, the danger of it and and it the danger of it is is a kind of, you know, we're all struggling against narcissism every moment of our lives. And and a lot of autofiction seems to have given in on that, <laughs> given in on that fight and just succumbed to it. Because, and and in general, I would rather, if I'm reading a novel, have a sense of, of the writer's imagination at work rather than just the writer, you know, looking in the mirror and, and bullshitting us about what he sees. Yes. But on the other hand, I mean, what, coming again, again from the nonfiction perspective, the, the, the kind of details that we kill to get, right? The, the amount of time we spend waiting around for something to happen to, to actually have that, and then for a reader not to believe it, my, my brother-in-law is a very smart, very well-educated guy. He was a physician and he was telling me about some book uh, that we read, mutually read. And he said, yeah, I really, I really enjoyed it. You know, the stuff, you know, where he like says, and then he went into the car and closed the door. I mean, that made up stuff. I, I, I didn't really need that, but I, 
And I said, it's not made up. That stuff, that whoever is sweating blood to get those things. Right. So it's, but I, I, I'm sure, I, I wonder if you two have experienced this, the way that young people will often use the term novel to describe all books, you know, lots of my journal, you know, my, my courses, and they're not commenting on whether it's reliable or not, but they will yeah. call it a book, a novel. And I think that's a very interesting, but very dangerous slippage in our vocabulary. When you start calling everything a novel, it really means you sort of think that everything's kind of made up. Yes. Front well, yeah, you would... really, excuse me, you really want to know, did it happen or did it not happen? I mean, that's a very basic human desire to, to know that. Uh, but, you know, it's gone back so far. I mean, I, I was, I've been reading Plutarch for complicated reasons, but he obviously made up a lot of stuff. I mean, a tremendous amount of, I mean, there's a scene, there's a, there's a moment where he's trying to decide whether Cleopatra was actually bitten by a snake or not. And he mm. says, well, from the tower window, people saw the imprint that the snake made in the sand across the thing. And you go, no one saw the imprint that the snake made in the sand, but it's such a great story that you just want to go with it. Mm. Yeah. Now, Robert, one thing I wanted to ask you is that, can you give some examples of writers, and you mentioned this in passing earlier, of writers, of journalists who very consciously want to construct their work as novels. Mm. I mean, I, I have an example that I want to discuss with both of you, but first I would like to hear from you. For example, I think you, you, you do think about Lawrence Wright in a certain way. So right. could you tell us a little bit, what do you think? Because there are several people in your book who will say, some of them actually, all of them journalists, wonderful journalists. Some of them will even say, I read more fiction than nonfiction. And some will say, I want to write like a novel, etc." So can you talk a little bit about that impulse among journalists to write about the news in a way that reads novelistically? Yeah, I mean, there was there was this trend, I think, in the you know '60s where people like Truman Capote and Norman Mailer, uh, I mean, you could cynically say they tried to revive their careers by turning to journalism, which was the hot game in town, or at least perceived to be that way. That's not any longer the case. And something like Lawrence Wright is a great example of when he first started writing *The Looming Tower*, his book about the rise of Al Qaeda, which won the Pulitzer Prize. Uh, he started writing it obviously right after 9-11. I remember talking to him and he said that he wanted to, he wanted to really wait and do this. He, there was a lot of pressure to do it quickly, right? And he wanted to wait and, you know, for a lot of reasons. And one of them, I think, was a literary reason. He wanted it to be settled enough that it would, uh, it would allow the kind of treatment, the kind of, the kind of pacing that a novel, novelist brings to a great story, uh, that it wasn't going to be a hot take. I mean, the books that have come out about Trump had been uh, compulsively readable, but no one would say they're great literature. I mean, and they don't claim to be. It's about how quickly they can get out. Um, but yeah, Lawrence Wright, as, and also he's written, you know, he's written screenplays, he's written plays, he's written, I always joke that he should probably write like epic poetry or something. He's, you know, written novels and he's thinking of himself very much as a writer. And that's the, I think that's when people say they read more fiction than nonfiction. That's what they're, I think, trying to say is that they think of themselves first and foremost as a writer, then as a journalist. Ah, got it. Now, Francine, there is a scene in, uh, because uh, Robert mentioned Truman Capote, there's a scene in the film at least, where the opening scene is a party <clears throat> and then there's silence and Capote is cutting a little clipping out from the New York Times and there's a glass of whiskey next to him. And the clipping is, about the Texas, uh, the massacre that has taken in Kansas, right? And that's what the starts his research in the mm -hmm. book. Is that something you yourself do, Francine? I mean, do you cut things out with a from the newspaper with a glass of whiskey next to you? <laughs> yes, on the whiskey. No, on the cutting out. I mean, no. I. I mean, I do have. I mean, I have shelves and shelves of. of but it's mostly from books. I mean, full confession. Mostly yeah. I read the New York Times online now because I live 15 miles from the nearest store and they don't deliver where I live. So, you know, oh. am I going to travel an hour a day to, no. But, uh, but sure, I mean, you know, and, and a story that interests me. And so I just like to add, you know, to, to what Robert said before, 
Patrick Redden Keefe is another one who does who writes nonfiction, mm -hmm. and yeah. I and I often find myself saying, you know, recommending say nothing to people and saying, yes. well, it reads just like a novel. It's page turner, just like, but you know, but it's beautifully written and. Mm -hmm. And I assume completely factual. So, yes, yes, so it's possible. Yes. I mean, I would rather, I would rather read that than, let's say, the sixth volume of Carl Ovis. Uh, mm. I struggle. Um, yeah, recently. I mean, Robert many years ago recommended, spoke very favorably about this young journalist Rachel Aviv. Oh, yeah. And I have, you know, recently I had to come to my own classroom also. I, you know, the sort of stories she finds. It's just startling. And then she does the hard work of finding more and more and then presenting it in a way uh, that's so beautifully structured. And so I always want my students to also be journalists. I mean, just pursue those stories too. But I also want to take some of those stories and do something else. I mean, I mean, I, when, when I was asking you guys the question about can you say something about a political novel that doesn't refer to the news? I was thinking, for example, about Kudzia's Waiting for the Barbarians or, you know, Disgrace. There is, because in both your cases, Francine, if you remember the example you gave of, the, of Middlemarch, the thing you affixed on was politics, where, you know, in other words, government or transaction of power. And I want to say even there are some of these books that, on one hand, I'm drawn to taking up, I do cut out things from the newspaper. Sometimes, in fact, I find something online, I find it so gripping that I go and buy the print newspaper so that I can then cut out and put it in my scrapbook. You know, it, so, so I want to use that sometimes, the news. And then on the other hand, I sometimes want to always, I dream of the kind of thing that Waiting for Barbarians was. You know, how do you remove to a different world and yet carry all the tension and all the troubles of the world that you actually inhabit. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Those I mean, are that's the promise of great science fiction, I guess, too, right? It's that's like yes, yes. those things. Yes. We, should, we are coming to this time when we have to switch to questions also, so we should encourage our friends who are still with us to provide some questions, because I have, I have been... Uh, on a rather narrow and selfish search in this conversation, I have thought of questions that I wanted these two wonderful people to answer for my benefit. But if the audience has questions, they should start posting it in q and I don't, I, I don't think I should be a patriarchal authority and demand that my daughter, if she's here, write a question. But uh, you're welcome to. Uh, I see many friends, so many friends, yes. Um, is Joyce Carol, Carol Oates out there? Maybe she <laughs> <laughs> People won't know that, what we are joking about. <laughs> oh, my God. Um, well, she's off writing her own a novel. Yeah. Right? Yeah. <laughs> and starting another. Can I ask you guys, um, was, was, what, I mean, Orwell was writing 1984, responding to the news, but also creating a different world, sort of, right? What are some other books that are doing that right now? Again, uh, Francine, I know that you had earlier said, so I'm saying, uh, apart from my book. <laughs> apart from your book? Yes. I don't, well, I don't, you know, again, I mean, I don't know, but at the moment, I mean, I yeah, I, I've, I've sort of shied away from dystopian novels. I mm. can't bear it anymore. I feel like I'm living in a dystopia. So why I should I? Why I should also I wonder. I wonder so much about. I mean, I was thinking about your novel and about again, like as Francine said, you know, the kind of the, the daring of trying to stare into the abyss and actually write something about it. I mean, I felt this way after 9/11. I felt there was nothing. I mean, I wasn't. I'm not a. Don't write about terrorism, international stuff. You know, the, the things I write about were completely irrelevant. And I felt completely, uh, I felt, I took it personally in a way. You know, they changed my subject of, and, and made everything. And I feel like this, that's Trump era too, sucking the air out of the room, but also, you know, it became sort of this one sort of subject. And if you, if you want to, if out of principle, want to turn away from it, then it sort of disempowers you as a writer, unless you're writing op-ed pieces and stuff like that. But you didn't do that. You or you're reading you're reading the news and thinking about Trump 
you're reading the news and thinking about uh, COVID, and you're also reading 1984 together. H how did you hold those things together in your mind and not, um, not, not have your head explode? Yeah, I don't know. Uh, I don't know, but I'm glad that you think it works. I was just, because I was keeping the journal, I would try to make sense of what was happening that day. I really, like my narrator, did take seriously this idea that I had to write a single revealing lie every day, mm. you know? So I was alert to that question. And we are living in such a world where unfortunately our politicians, our leaders reward us for such <clears throat> vigilance, you know? I mean, it's extraordinary to me. I find it obscene actually, that someone like Modi will have turned all the tragedy of the deaths from COVID in India, again, into some sort of a success story. And he will win again at the next election. And, uh, you know, I, there are young people in India who are protesting and it's wonderful to see it. Some of them are being put in jails, but for me, the question has not gone away. You know, that book that you guys have been kind enough to read, um, it seems to me unfinished work. And I'm still every day trying to make sense of what are the new things that they are saying and how they are trying to fashion that into a triumphalist narrative. And, you know, but the ruling party is certainly there. Here, you guys have gotten rid of Trump, not necessarily of Trumpism, mm. but India has got Modi and Modi will come back to power. So I feel the job is not even done. But you mentioned Kapuscinski before, and I think about the when he wrote about uh, Shah of Iran, Shah of Shahs, or he wrote about Haile Selassie and the emperor, you know, he takes this fabulous sort of approach, right? If he's going to write about these people who are, you know, not distant history, but certainly not, you know, not breaking news and sort of tries to be fanciful about that to get at these deeper points. And indeed is in a veiled way writing about the totalitarianism or the authoritarianism of Poland itself, right? Ah, so, I see. You know, how, how, how many different layers there. I, yes. I just wonder whether that might be, maybe you should you know, write something utterly fantastical as a way to get at someone. I mean, uh, again, something like Modi yes. is such an, I mean, he is this, this self-created, you know, Horatio Alger on steroids kind of figure. Um, that has, I mean, I just think that the ex, the Indian expat community here, when he took over like Madison Square Garden and like pr broke the house down, I mean, it's extraordinary. How, you know, I could see that being an amazing character for something like an A.J. Liebling or something like that, this, this larger than life character, but writing it as fiction. Okay, very good, yes. There is a question. Would you like Amitava to give your book to Modi, Trump and Modi? Your publisher should. Yeah, well. <laughs> That's a good question. They don't read. I don't think they read. I don't think they read. Um, but you want to go back to India is the question. If, yeah. Yes, I do. And I think, um, you know, the way they fabricate cases against the dissenters is just astonishing. So uh, we are, we have in, you know, right now we have, uh, Robert, you and I are talking to someone who is past president of Penn. I think I'll need her help when the, uh, they arrest me at the airport. <laughs> no, I was just saying, yeah, well, there, right. Let's just hope it doesn't happen here. I mean, yeah, it's so frightening. <laughs> it's so yeah. frightening. And and I, pro in all likelihood, all three of us are on some kind of list. I mean, I don't mean yes. to sound like the world's biggest paranoid, but mm. just being realistic. So we're just hoping to hold the line as long and hard as we can. How to amplify it? How to, I mean, uh, the question also comes, you know, for example, Francine, in response to a certain situation that you saw happening in the academy, you wrote The Blue Angel. You know, just to have a conversation on issues of how do we make charges again? You know, I, I, I included in a course I called Campus Novels. You know, I just thought, let my students read about different accounts of what happens on campuses. So you were thinking about the news in a broad way. You were responding to a cultural moment. And so in this book that you have read, I was trying to respond to this cultural moment about fake news. And it is only getting worse, at least in the Indian scenario. And I'm very curious how to amplify it, by which I mean, how to make one's protest a little bit more effective. What to, else to do? I like the move I have spoken the other day to some friends. I like that 
Claudia Rankin Citizen, for example, became a live account. In subsequent editions had on a page, the newer deaths that had taken place. The book then becomes of sort of a living testimony to this barbarity. And I'm just curious, formally and otherwise, how else to respond to the challenges of the moment, apart from just writing a novel? Well, we can only do what we do. I mean, we're writers and we're teachers, and I think in both those ways. You know, I I write these little essays for The Guardian, which are, you know, you just, they're like ships in bottles. You just hope, you send them out there and hope that somebody picks them up. And, you know, the, the problem, I mean, I think one of the problems that we all face is, is, is the issue of preaching to the choir. I mean, yes. you know, that is yes. how, who is going to, but I think, but, you know, there's a, quite a wonderful essay by Rebecca Solna just about that question. And she said, if that's what you can do, that's what you can do because it does make the members of the choir feel less alone wherever mm -hmm. they are. And fine, I mean, that's, yes. if that's the limitations. Do I actually think that anything I write for the Guardian is it gonna convince a Trump supporter of my point of view? No, but, I, but nonetheless, I feel that some moral obligation to keep putting it out there. Yes. Do you remember the, do, sorry, I was just going to say, ask Robert, uh, Robert, just a second. Uh, do you remember the title of that Rebecca Solnit piece, Francine? It might be called Preaching to the Choir. I can't oh, okay, remember. Okay. Sorry. All right. Uh, so Robert, what were we going to say? I'm sorry I interrupted you. Oh, that's okay. I was just going to say that, that sometimes I, th I think about the, the, the reactions being perhaps not literary or even not journalistic. You know, I mean, I think about my, my friend, Bobby Ghosh, who was editor in chief of The Hindu, yeah, and or Hindustan his, Times or something like that. Yeah. Hindustan Times, that's right. Yeah, yeah. And he, uh, you know, he, his, his offending, uh, among his offending acts was putting together a, a chart that would keep track of the acts of violence based on you know, discrimination and, and ethnic hatred and things like that. that. That tracker was enough to get him kicked out of that job and kicked out of India. Yes. By yes, Modi. That's right. right? That's and right. that was not a great piece of investigative journalism. That was just sort of saying, this is happening. Yes. We're going to keep track in an open public way. And that was too much. Yes. But I think sometimes those sort of, this sort of, uh, it's like what Orwell says in, you know, homage to Catalonia, you know, he, you know, he puts those pages from the, uh, the, 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 the revolution, various newspaper clippings. And he says that in his, in his uh, essay, you know, why I write, he says, you know, I put them there. I know it got in the way of the, not uh, gotten the way of, I said it got in the way of the, the story, but I wanted, I just wanted to put it there. I yeah. wanted to make sure that no one ever forgot that and documentary yeah. impulse. I sometimes yes. think the documentary impulse has to sort of come to the fore and the aesthetic maybe has to sort of step back. Yes, yes, I like that. We'll soon be coming to a close. So if people want to uh, have any thoughts that they want to share or any questions they want to ask. Your daughter's in trouble, I tell you. She's <laughs> in trouble tonight. I see, I see, I see. Yeah, I think I, I, I see that she's not here anymore. All right, no problem. Eileen is there, Divya is there. I see Leah. I, I thought a moment ago I saw Garrett Hunger. Oh yeah, he's there. Come on guys, PC. Mm -hmm. um, Allow me to ask you then, please. What, so so we, if for those of you who have not read Amitava's a book, the narrator is a, an academic on leave at a Italian uh, sort of writer's retreat, think tank kind of thing, very luxurious during the time of COVID. He's writing a book about, uh, and, and which is a compilation of his diaries and, and other sort of musings. Um, you, Amitav, are now uh, at Yaddo, <laughs> yes. where you are also a writer on leave in some sense from his academic uh, post. And you are also, I gather, writing another novel. What, what, what are you writing about now? Yes, I, I came to Yado just for two days, but now I'm just sticking around and I'm going day after tomorrow. Um, okay, there's a question, but we'll see in a, in a second. What I'm writing right now, I kept thinking, and this is why the urgency of my question to the two of you saying, my earlier saying that I don't think I'm at, we are at the end of fake news. In fact, it is now got into a stage where there are so many people, especially the young behind bars in India, that I feel uh, that one should talk a bit more about them. So I'm trying to write a little bit by going back in history instead of moving from the time right now 
to something earlier and thinking, where are the roots of some of these things, you know? Like just today I was thinking of a particular act of violence against a Muslim girl in India. And I was thinking, should one immediately talk about the partition and what the Brits did? Or is it kind of wrong to go back so much in the past? So I'm wrestling with the question mm. of whether one should connect the past to the present, sometimes in ways that seem compelling, or should one just, or is, this, is that a way of finding excuses sometimes? So that's what I'm wrestling with at the moment. You know, what does something that happened in 1947 have to do with what is happening in 2021? Everything? So, yeah. <laughs> you think so, Francine? Is that your... Well, sure. I mean, you know, the, the, the outbursts of quote-unquote communal violence that yes. happen every six months or every year certainly have their roots in, in 19, what happened in 1947. So it's yes. not as if it's over. I mean, Midnight's yeah. Children is probably the best book to try to understand what partition was all about, right? Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. Shall I just look at what uh, someone had said? No, there's no open questions. All right. Uh, so that's what I'm doing. Um, and this is Yado. I'm sitting in the library here. Uh, Francine, you've been here, right? No, I've never been there. Okay. I've never been to any. No, I, I live in a kind of Yado with, you know, yes. just us. Yes. So, so, no. There is a chat. There's a note from Divya. Thank you for this lovely discussion. Here's a question for all. If I could go back to the question of clipping and the implied implied desire or piqued interest, the act of clipping implies or produces in subtly documents because it makes selection known. How are we gathering those acts now? How are we gathering clippings as we wade through the internet? Cool. So Francine, you read it online, the, Nash, the New York Times. Do you gather clippings at all? Yes, I think they're called bookmarks. I mean, ah, you have a you know, ah, it's not that hard. It's like, even I can do it. You just put a little star by it and you oh. can go back to it. Robert, what do you do? You know, I don't, I, I, uh, I, I find myself, I will sort of copy and paste and put stuff in Google documents, but no clippings, it's, it's true. Clippings are, uh, was a way, I mean, it's like the, the keepsake, you know, the, 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 the what do they call those, the, those notebooks you keep. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. I know what you're I talking keep about. Those, yes. you know, with little just random quotes in it and stuff. I, I don't do that thing, that kind of thing enough. Uh, and I, I, I mean, my last book came out of a clipping that I, I read about some Japanese being released from, from North Korea and I clipped it and thought, God, what must they have experienced? And then 10 years later, eight years later, I was able to go actually talk to them and find that out. But so some of those things pay off. I still have these yellowing, you know, folders with clippings in them from, from, from early days of my yes. career. Same uh, with me. I yeah. must confess, I, I must actually inform Divya who asked that question, that I actually have a Word document where I take, um, let's say if I take a screen grab or whatever it is called here, mm -hmm. screenshot or on the computer, then under a particular date that I have done it, I just put it there. And sometimes I even have notes under it. And that's the way I have been keep keeping track. a journal and, and I keep it it's like a news journal yeah. um, because I'm really, really interested in pursuing some of these stories, uh, either novelistically or just going back and doing work journalistically on them. Uh, and in some cases, I've even asked my students to, especially if there are events that are happening around us, you know, Francine and I are near neighbors in a way. If something is happening, I heard, for example, Francine, a student, a high school student in the Hudson Valley uh, for July 4th, she uh, had uh, the Pledge of Allegiance or something recited in Arabic. And then the, some of the parents freaked out about it and there was a problem. And I then have asked a student right now in my class to follow it up as a story. So that was from my little clipping, so to speak, in my virtual journal here i've been able to offer some a story to a kid also someone is saying and nice to see francine whom i met at mrs london's in saratoga when she was taking tea with bob boyers all right i see the yado library as a sacred space for the books by so many amazing authors including Noah. yes 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 very good thank you patricia 
and k is back we have reached our end yes i uh, over to you k you can thank and then uh, my thanks are always here for both everyone who has attended our discussion and certainly to these two wonderful people whom i owe so many drinks now oh <laughs> okay all right now we're thank talking. you all so much <laughs> this, this was this was great uh and i appreciate everyone who participated in the chat tonight and there's lots of books you can look up on our website from this man just trying to keep up with y'all <laughs> reader writers uh thank you and once again to say please support amitava in the new book a time outside this time which you can purchase at greenlight bookstore either on our web or in store and congratulations amitava on the publication of your book and thank you francine and robert for joining us for this great conversation thank, thank you, you very everyone. much thank you i enjoyed it love you okay. thank fun. you thank Take you bye. bye everyone bye. have a good night